and welcome to the Story Maker Show. We've got a brand new studio ready to go. So, Karen and Hamza, are you ready? Ready. Ready. Kimmy the beatboxer, are you ready? Ready. Story Slammers, are you ready? Then let the countdown begin. Ten. Welcome to the Storymaker Show and can I just say we are overjoyed to be joining you in classrooms from Brazil to Swindon. Now today we are celebrating stories and how we share them because, as we all know, stories really can change the world. Change the world, I hear you ask. That's right, stories can change how we understand other people and they can inspire us to stand up, make some noise and say what you believe. We've got some amazing authors in the studio and a draw along with former Waterstones Children's Laureate, Chris Riddell, coming up. Woo! Gosh, that's a lot to cover in 30 minutes, so we better get started. Please make some noise for our first guest, Hamza Arshad. He is here to talk about the first book he's ever written, Little Bad Man and the Invasion of the Killer Aunties. Welcome, Hamza! Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. So, Hamza, who is Little Bad Man? Okay, so, um, where do I start? Okay, so Little Bad Man's me, and me as a young boy, and I was very naughty, uh, which is not a cool thing. Um, and I'd always get myself into trouble, um, but through all the trouble that I used to get into, I would get out of it somehow and learn from it. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's a really funny story. I have to say that because I wrote it. <laughs> I, I, I can vouch for that. I've read a little bit. It sounds brilliant. Um, can you read us some? Yeah, definitely. If you guys want me to read it. Do we want him to read some? Yeah! See, school is just a place I go to every day. Sort of like prison, but with worse food. My real work is making the greatest rap music video ever produced. How else am I expected to become so famous that people fight wars over me? I'm going to be so big, Little Bad Man Impersonator will be a valid career choice. I'm going to be so popular that cats will learn to speak just to ask me for a selfie. I'm going to be so rich that even my butler's butler will have a butler. <laughs> and the only way to do any of that is to make myself a smash hit music video. Enter my cameraman, Omar. Now, Omar may not have a lot of media training and he might be shooting on his dad's old Nokia from the Stone Age. And he may shake quite a lot when he's nervous, but all of that aside, he's got a pretty good eye. And more importantly, he's the only one I can get to do the job. But it shouldn't matter too much. After all, when you're pointing the camera at me, it's hard to go wrong. Uh, Hamza, said Omar 10 minutes later, while looking through the tiny screen on his phone. I don't know how gangster this feels. What do you mean? Well, it kind of looks like you're in a toilet at a primary school. Really? How can you tell? Probably the little urinals, they're a bit of a giveaway. Hmm, that ain't ideal, but it's the best we're gonna do. Uh, can you frame them out? Maybe. I'm trying not to show too much of the graffiti. Why? We did that specially. Well, it's just that it doesn't look very real. You can tell we've done it on paper and stuck it on the walls. Of course we have. We don't want to get in trouble, do we? I said. Yeah, no, of course, but you know, that's the bit where that's not very gangster. I see what you're saying. Real rappers don't worry about getting detention. Okay, show a bit of the toilets and a bit of the graffiti. People are mostly going to be looking at me anyway. Got it, said Umar, and hit the record. I took a deep breath and pulled my best gangster face. Basically, you just squint a little and look like you've never smiled for a photo in your life. Then I started spitting my rhymes. B to the A to the D to the man. If others rappers can't, little bad man can. Straight from the hood like a rat from a drain. Rhyme so sick, they're melting my brain. That was as far as I got before the door to the toilet burst open. That was great, that was great. So you're actually rocking a hat, a little bit like the one little bad man wears. Did you get inspiration from your own family for the characters? Yeah, my, uh, my family are very funny. 
Uh, they do really silly things all the time. So I would I would look at uh, a lot of my like aunties and uncles and and my mom and my dad, and I would exaggerate the characters and I'd make it into you know the characters that you see and read in the book. So uh, yeah, I kind of just kind of look at my own life and just over exaggerated everything. Yeah, and your surroundings. And yeah. Stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So what did you like reading when you were a kid? I, I did like Harry Potter and all of those books. Do you know Harry Potter? You said Harry Potter before. Um, but you know, when I was growing up, actually, to be fair, I didn't do as much reading as I wanted to. Oh. I started really late. And I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make a, uh, a children's book, because I was like, I don't feel that there was many uh, stories or many books that I could relate to. Like if I saw like, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a little boy or, or a girl, you know, on a front cover that looked like me, I'd be like, oh, you know, we can may maybe I can relate a lot from this story. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's why I think it's really important for me to 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 write this story for, you know, so many other people who, would, you know, want to read something that they could relate to. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And Hamza, who wrote the rap lyrics? Well, you know, I don't want to show off, but uh, me uh, and my friend. Uh, Henry White, who's amazing, by the way. Yeah, so we wrote the rap. You wrote them together. Yeah. And the burning question, can you rap? Well, can you? I could give it a go. B to the A to the D to the man. Ain't gonna stand for no alien plan. You mess with my school and you mess with my fam. So now I'm hitting back with my lyrical jam. Oh yeah. Wow. If you can rap. Whew. Now, where were we? Uh, how did you find writing a story different from making a video? Oh, I think writing a book's harder because my spelling's a little bit not, you know, not the, not the best, um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very different. I mean, when you're making a video, you just put on the camera and you just start being silly. But, uh, you know, it takes more time to write a book. But it's more fun as well because you can, you, can, you can make a story about, you know, climbing a mountain. And, you know, probably filming it is a bit dangerous. So <laughs> I'd rather just write about it. So, yeah, I think it, is, it does take a bit longer, yeah. uh, but it's so worth it at the end. And you, you can do so much. Did you find that you used your imagination in a different way to making videos? Um, yeah, I think that when you're writing a book, you can write about anything. You know, you could write about dragons or waterfalls or, you know, exploring the jungles or, or aliens or, you know, whatever you want. You could just kind of, you know, write it down. And I think that's, the, that's why it's so cool to write stories because, you know, whatever you want to you know, write about, you can. It's, there's the, the world's, world's your oyster, I'd say. Very true. So we're going to work together now, Hamza, because some of our studio guests are going to go off and write their own raps for a story slam at the end of the show. So will you give them a helping ham hand, Hamza? Yeah, definitely. Yeah? If you guys pay me £50,000 each. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's, that's confirmed verbal agreement. They're very prepared. Have we got any volunteers? That's Loads everyone. of volunteers. Ooh. Okay then, guys. While the soon-to-be superstar rappers rehearse, we're going to meet Nelifa Hadayat, a journalist who passionately believes in meeting real people and reporting their stories to the world. Have your pencils ready, as she's about to give us her five top interviewing tips. So make sure you write them down so you remember them. I'm Nelifa Hidayat. I'm a journalist. You might have seen some of my reports on TV. I've worked for all sorts of people. I've written for newspapers. I've worked on Newsround, a news show for children. And I make documentaries where I look really deeply into one specific subject. Now in my job, I get to travel around the world and meet people in extraordinary sets of situations. Now I've met farmers in Vietnam, fishermen, in Ghana and I've even met people like JK Rowling and for me it doesn't really matter how big or small their story is because all stories are important to tell. So now here are my five top tips on making sure you do a really good interview. Number one, do your research. Now imagine you get to interview your hero for the local newspaper. Who's that person going to be? Is it an astronaut, maybe a footballer, 
Maybe you'll be a writer or something I've done in the past. Why don't you interview your mum? Now you want to find out the most interesting things about them, where they're from, what they like, what they don't like, and you can go online to the internet to find that out or go to the library and get a book out. Now you want to do as much research as possible because you want the conversation with them to feel really natural. Number two, ask open-ended questions. To try and get really good answers from the person you're interviewing, use the five W's. Now this helps me a lot when I'm doing my job. They are who, what, where, when and why. There's also an H, which is how. Three, be prepared for the unexpected. Now I know as good journalists, you've got your questions written down, but sometimes a question about one thing can lead to something more interesting in their answer. So you don't have to stick to the questions that you've written. If your interviewee says something interesting, be prepared to ask them more about it. We call that a follow-up. When I was interviewing Malala Yousafzai in Edinburgh one day, she started to tell me about how much she loves living in the UK. Now, my questions were all about her time in her homeland, Pakistan. But when I found out how much she loves Scotland and the weather and how grumpy she was about all the rain, I found that to be really interesting. So I asked her about her experiences in the UK and we had a really nice conversation about it. Number four, take notes too so you don't forget anything. Now, do you think that you've got a good memory? Can you even remember the first three tips that I've given you so far? Well, don't worry if you don't, because like me, you should be taking notes in your notebook when you're doing an interview. So when it's time to write things down or to even remember facts later on, you've got them in your notebook ready when you need them. Number five, remember, they're just human. People are like you and me. Stephen Hawking was once a boy who liked to look up at the night sky. Michelle Obama was a girl who enjoyed board games and Friday night pizzas. And Malala was a determined young woman who wouldn't let anything stop her from learning. Whoever it is you're interviewing, remember that you probably have a lot more in common with them than you think. Now you can practice interviewing with your friends and family. You might even find out something extraordinary about your teacher because everyone's got a story to tell. I know that firsthand. This is one of my favorite stories. It's Malala's. And I'm gonna sit down and have a good read. Do any of you want to be journalists or reporters when you grow up? Nelifer tells real life stories and our next author's book has been inspired by her own family history. Please give a big cheer for Karen! Yay! Thank you, thank you. Karen, thank you for coming all the way from America. It's good to be here, thank you. No problem. Can you please tell us a little bit about your new book, How High the Moon? Yeah, uh, it's about uh, an 11 year old girl named Ella who um, she, she grows up, she's growing up in the 1940s in South Carolina in America, and it's segregated in the South, so black people live in one place and go to different places separately from white people. So today we're looking at how stories change our world. How would you say that stories have changed your world? Oh, I think, I mean, for me, I, I've always been a big reader. Um, I grew up around a lot of books. My mother was a librarian, so I really kind of went into books. Um, and I think for me, traveling into a book, into another person's story, not only do you get to visit their world, which might be you know many, many miles from where you live in your world, but you also, um, you, you learn to have empathy for other people. You learn to understand how other people live and how they feel and what makes them tick. And not just in the book, but then after you step out of the book, away from the book, in life, I think it's, uh, it's helped me understand other people a lot better. Very, very important. Well, thank you so much, Karen. We'll be asking Karen some more questions later. Um, how's the prep for the story slam coming, Hamza? Yeah, we're doing fine. It's going well. Thanks for asking. Give a thumbs up at least, isn't it? Come on, man. Okay, let's hope they've come up with something. Now, every two years, an author or illustrator is chosen to be the Waterstones Children's Laureate. Past laureates have included Quentin Blake, 
Jacqueline Wilson and Michael Morpurgo. Here they are illustrated as superheroes. The Laureate's mission is to help more people discover books and stories and during their time as a Laureate they can do anything to make this happen like start a book festival or help save libraries which brings me on to our next guest. Hello, I'm Chris Riddell and I'm a writer and an illustrator. Um, I've done books such as uh, Mr Underbed, a picture book, uh, a series of books about a little girl called Ottoline and a series of books about a girl um, called Ada Goth. They're called the Goth Girl books. I've also worked with Paul Stewart, a very good friend of mine who's a wonderful writer, and we wrote The Edge Chronicles together. Now, I was Children's Laureate between 2015 and 2017, and I've got a medal in this rather impressive case. Um, it usually lives on my mantelpiece, and occasionally when I need to, I come downstairs, I open this case, and I take my medal out. Here it is. And just to make myself feel good, I just stroke it very gently. It's a lovely feeling. Very, very lovely medal. I shall put that back to keep it safe. I love drawing and I keep sketchbooks all the time. And I like sometimes to draw what I've been doing to remind myself uh, when I look back through my sketchbook what I might be up to. So I brought a sketchbook along today and um, here are a few um, drawings of things I was doing. Now here I am in a studio on, uh, on BBC um, World Service TV. I'm sitting there all ready to talk to someone. Um, I'm not going to mention Brexit. Uh, and here I am sitting drawing a famous cartoonist at the National Portrait Gallery. And that's something I love doing, actually going to museums with a sketchbook, finding something I like and just sitting on one of those little stools they give you and drawing. And here I am pretending to be a wizard because I've also illustrated a book written by an author I'm sure you'll know called J.K. Rowling, um, The Tales of Beadle Labard. So here I am impersonating a wizard. And here I am at uh, a bookshop signing lots of copies of books. So I love drawing. I thought what we could do is a little drawing together. I'm going to draw a character from the Edge Chronicles, my favourite character from the Edge Chronicles. And um, if you've got a paper and pencil in front of you, I hope you have, we can draw along together. I'm going to start with the ears. Now, the band bear is a great big creature, twice the size of a grizzly bear. But he has very small, delicate ears. And I'm just drawing the ears now. So they're quite small and delicate and they twitch because the Vanda Bear listens out for sounds in the forest. If uh, he's got very, very good hearing and he's a big, fierce creature who isn't afraid of anything at all in the deep woods. I'm now drawing his eyebrows. He can look quite fierce. That's one eye, and that's another eye. He might have heard the snapping of a twig. He's a little bit concerned. He's wondering whether there's something out in the forest. And the bears live in the vast deep woods. They build nests each night to sleep in, nests of grasses to keep them warm and safe. I'm now drawing his nose, see if you can keep up. These are his side whiskers. And the most distinct, distinctive thing about the Vanda Bear is his tusks. The Vanda Bear has these two large tusks. They're very, very useful for plucking fruit from high up branches and very, very good for defending himself if he's attacked by creatures in the deep woods. I'm drawing his jaw and his big, hairy and quite mossy fur. Here he is. You can see he is really quite large, quite fierce. But don't be fooled. Banda bears are very gentle. And if you meet a Banda bear in the deep woods, the 
you can make friends with a band of bear quite easily as long as it knows that you're not, uh, you don't mean in any harm. And then the band of bear will protect you and will be the best friend you could, you could have because he'll defend you in the deep woods. The only thing this great big fierce creature is afraid of is a very small creature and I'm just going to draw in the background the little creature that the band of bear is most afraid of. And it's a very small creature that looks a little bit like an orange tennis ball bouncing through the forest. And you wouldn't be afraid of it if you just saw a little orange creature like this bouncing along. along. But what the band of bear knows is that when you see one of these little creatures behind it, there will be hundreds, possibly thousands following along because they hunt in packs. And when they spot a band of bear, they all get together, they open their mouths, which are full of teeth. And they will pursue the band of bear through the forest. The only creature that the band of bear is afraid of is this creature, and it's called a wigwig. Drawing is really good fun, and if you have a sketchbook with you at all times and you're somewhere, in, if you're in a museum or you're um, you know, relaxing in front of the TV, you can take out your sketchbook and you can draw something and you can invent your own creatures. And inventing creatures is a lovely way into thinking of stories and writing your own stories. So I say to anyone who wants to become an illustrator or a writer, keep a sketchbook, and fill up your sketchbook with drawings and ideas. Here is the drawing that Chris did. Isn't it brilliant? How are your band of bears looking? Maybe one of you will be the next children's laureate. Now Hamza and Karen are back to answer some questions. So who's got one? Um, yeah, go for it. Why, why do you put funniest things in your books? Why do I put funniest things in my book? Because I like to make people laugh. I think it's fun. You know, when, when, when you laugh, do you like laughing? Yeah, see, there you go. That's why I did it. So yeah, I tried to, I just wanted to make the funniest book ever and I just wanted when people to, uh, to read it, I just want them to laugh. Great, who else got a question? Uh, yeah. How long did it take to make your book? Um, 40 years. <laughs> Normally joking, now I'm joking. <laughs> uh, um, now it took, I think it took about a year because you have to like, I think the hardest bit is to um, know all your characters, know your world, know what the, the base of the story is. And then when you start writing, then that's the easy part. Uh, but just to prepare everything, I think was quite hard for me because it's my first time as well. So yeah. Yeah, what about you? For me, I think it probably was about three, three. years, probably from beginning to end. And it's the same thing. You, you Also, you can start out with some ideas and then things change drastically, yeah. you know? Suddenly characters that you thought were really important don't seem like they belong there anymore or that they should maybe be in the back a little bit and other people are more important to bring to the front. And mm -hmm. so things change around a, lo a lot. You look at it and go, oh, this is different than I thought. I think I need to go this direction. So it takes, it can take a while sometimes. Great, thanks guys. So um, now it's time for the bit you've all been waiting for, our story slam. Red Corner, are you ready to wrap? Green, show me what you mean. Right, let's start this story slam. B to the O to the O to the K, where are you gonna go today? Stories are strong, they can be so effective. Lost in a book and you change your perspective. Freedom is yours when you're lost in a book. Freedom is yours. And over to the red team. Books have a good spelling, that's very true. And they help me learn new as I never knew. Books help my mind run free, just like a yellow and black bumblebee. I like Harry Potter, that trunch ball, that rotter. Books are fantastic, books are so great. I love them so much, I can read them all day. Yes, I love them so much, I can read them all day. Even my parents, they put them away. And over to the green team. <laughs> Choose a book off a shelf at home or school. Don't worry about it. Library's all. Fantasy words go back in history. Back in time to solve the mystery. Don't laugh or cry. Dare or die. When you're lost in a book, your imagination flies. 
Wow, what a show we've had. I hope you're all feeling inspired to go out there and change the world with stories. Get reading and get writing. I think we may have some future children's laureates out there. You can watch all the videos from today's show again on the new Puffin School's website and we can't wait to see you for Empathy Day in June with Owen Colfer and Mallory Blackman. Until then, bye! I think my favourite book is Harry Potter or Skullduggery Pleasant. Harry Potter. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Harry Potter and the Little Bad Man. Well, because you can get smarter and learn new things. Um, because it helps you new words and imagines things that you never knew. It helps you learn new words. Um, uh, you can get a free toy with the book. I would ask them what their favourite book is and read them with expression. We interrupt your usual viewing with breaking news. Rowdy Jefferson of Wimpy Kid fame will reveal all about his friendship with Greg Heffley in a new book coming this April. Titled Diary of an Awesome Friendly Kid, get ready to see the Wimpy Kid world in a whole new way. It seems that there are two sides to every story, and Riley thinks it's time that he should have a say. Meanwhile, Greg Heffley has commented that Riley becoming an author is a stupid idea. Update we'll more of this story as it happens. And now for the main headlines. Boom! Families across the country are outrageous Susan Heffley restricts TV time as a New Year's resolution. Boom! Peace talks continue between Laurie and Upper Surrey Street Kids. Boom! And news just in, Rowley's new book may shed light on the rumours of the gold guy who lives in the woods. We'll keep you updated as soon as we know more. And to end, I'm delighted to let you know that a local dog has made a full recovery from the cheese touch.